Here we're going to talk about the fundamental forces in the universe and universal gravitation, which is yet another of Newton's laws. There are four fundamental forces of nature. These are the forces that govern everything that we see in the universe around us. Essentially, they determine how the particles in the universe will interact. All the other forces, or so-called forces, like friction and applied force and tension and compression, forces like those, are the macroscopic effects of these four forces. So we can take any of those so-called forces and we can explain um, which forces or force are responsible for those effects. Um, and we would choose one or more of the four fundamental forces. All of these forces are forces at a distance, or action at a distance forces, so they are not contact forces. You already know about one of them, and that's gravity. Another one of these four forces is the electromagnetic force. <clears throat> Magnetism is really just an effect of relativity and is related to the electrical force, and we'll talk more about that in our electromagnetism unit. We also have the weak nuclear force, and not surprisingly, we have the strong nuclear force. And we'll talk a little bit about what each of these forces does. The strong nuclear force is, not surprisingly, the strongest of the four fundamental forces. So that should be easy to remember given its name. It's also called the strong interaction. And it's the force that binds all of the positively charged particles inside the nucleus of the atom together. You may wonder, how is it that all those protons stay together, tightly packed inside the nucleus, when all the protons have the same positive charge and really should be pushing each other away? Well, the strong interaction, or the strong nuclear force, overcomes that repulsive electric force between the protons and keeps them together in the nucleus of the atom. Now even though the strong nuclear force is the strongest of the four fundamental forces, it's only uh, strong over a very tiny distance. So it has a very small range, we say. Um, the range is about the size of a nucleus, so outside the nucleus of an atom, the strong nuclear force really is not strong at all. It, um, its strength drops off to be negligible, in fact. The weak nuclear force is the force that's responsible for some of the nuclear phenomena like beta decay. So the decay of some subatomic particles um, occurs because of the weak nuclear force. So certain types of radiation exist because of the weak nuclear force. The electromagnetic force is the force that exists between all charged particles. And this is the force that's responsible for the properties of matter that we observe every day. So normal force, friction, most applied forces, tension, these are all forces that are contact forces, and so they are forces that depend on the electromagnetic force between those particles. And the electromagnetic force has infinite range. It never drops to zero, no matter what the distance. Gravity is the weakest of the four fundamental forces, but it's extremely important because it also has infinite range and exists between all particles with mass. So weak though that we don't really notice it much between people or between smaller objects on the Earth. We normally only notice it when we're dealing with very large masses like planets or moons or stars. Gravity is always attractive and it cannot be shielded against. <clears throat> 
So there's no special suit that you can wear that will protect you from gravity. Gravity is everywhere. Now one way to represent the relationship that describes gravity is with a proportionality statement. We could write it like this. which tells us that the force of gravity is directly proportional to m1 times m2, where those two, m1 and m2, are the masses of the two objects between which the gravity is acting. So if I double mass m1, then I must also double the force of gravity between the two masses. If I double mass m2 as well, then 2 times 2 is 4, so I must have multiplied the force of gravity by 4. So that shows us a little bit about how the proportionality works. The other relationship here that Newton found shows us that the force of gravity between objects is inversely proportional to the distance between the centers of the object's masses. So r is the distance between the centers of mass of the two objects. And we can see that since it's 1 over r squared, this is an indirect proportionality. So that means that if we increase r, the distance between the objects, then we decrease the force of gravity. If r goes up, then the force of gravity goes down. And this should be a that should be a proportionality symbol. So R is measured, as I said, between the centers of mass of the objects. And we typically measure it in meters. Let's see if we can work through these changes to determine the effect on the force of gravity. So here we see we have two masses m and m with a force of gravity f between them when the distance between them is d. If I increase one mass by multiplying it by two then as I showed you earlier we double the force so now the force of gravity is 2f twice as great as it was. If we double both of the masses, let's see what happens. And again, as I mentioned in the last slide, 2 times 2 is 4. So by doubling each of the masses, we now get a force of gravity, which is 4 times as great as the original force. So if I triple one of the masses, we get 3 times the force that we initially had and that shows us how the proportionality for mass works with the force of gravity. Notice the distance didn't change in each of these cases. D remained the same, or R was constant. Let's see what happens when we change the distance between the objects. Well, if we increase the distance by a factor of 2, so we double the distance, now we have 1 over 2 squared, or 1 over 2d squared, which gives us 1 over 4d squared. So the force must be a quarter as great as it was. This is known as the inverse square law, and we see it in lots of different places in physics. All of the fundamental forces that we've discussed, in fact, obey the inverse square law. What happens if we have the distance between the masses? We cut the distance in half. Well, now the force is going to be four times as strong, since we have 1 over 1 half times d, and then we square the whole thing. 1 over, well, 1 half squared is 1 quarter. And so we end up with 
4 over d squared. So when compared to 1 over d squared, this is 4 times as great. So the force is now 4 times as great. What happens if we double both of the masses and we also double the distance? We're back to the same force that we had to begin with. So here we've got our new force F2 over our original force F1. And our new force F2 would be 2m times 2m over 2d squared. Our original force F1 is m times m over d squared. There is a constant involved here, but we'll look at that later on. So here we've got m divided by m is 1. Here we've got m divided by m is 1. We've got 2 divided by 2 is 1. And we've got d squared divided by d squared is 1. So on the right-hand side, we just get 1, which means that F2 must be equal to 1 times F1. So our new force is just F. It's equivalent to the original force. Here's a graph of the acceleration due to gravity versus the distance from the Earth's center of the object. You can see that it steeply drops off um, and has a curved shape. Uh, well, Newton's second law tells us that acceleration is directly proportional to force. And so if the acceleration drops off that way, then the force of gravity also drops off that way. So the inverse square law shows us a curved shape. And that's, um, as I said, something that you see in physics in many cases. Now, it took a while to find what we call a constant of proportionality to turn this relationship into an equation, but it was found by a scientist named Henry Cavendish. He did an experiment to measure the force of gravity between masses on the Earth, relatively small masses, and he got an accurate value for the constant of proportionality that we needed. And that's the value for big G. We call that the universal gravitational constant. So that's 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meters squared per kilogram squared. So that should be newtons times meters squared. That's what that means. We put a dot in there. And this is how Cavendish did it. He used what's called a torsion balance. A, a, a light rod that was suspended by a wire with two relatively heavy spheres attached to the ends of the rod. Um, or rather light spheres, but they were attracted to larger spheres. We can see those in blue right down here. And when the long rod was twisted, the torsion or twisting of the wire exerted um, a force that was proportional to the angle of rotation of the rod. Measuring that force, Cavendish was able to determine big G, and it's a value that we use today, a very accurate value. Now, gravity is always an attractive force, so the direction of the force is on a line that connects the two centers of masses uh, in question. So here we can see that the force of gravity is in a straight line like so. And you can see the arrows indicate that it's an attractive force between those two objects. Let's try an example. Let's estimate the magnitude of the gravitational attraction between you and the person sitting next to you. So in this example, we've got um, our masses, the given masses of two students. So given values here. So here are the given values. Here's another given value, the distance between the students. We'll say that you are sitting about a meter from your neighbor. So we use our equation for Newton's law of universal gravitation. Fg equals big G times m1 times m2 over r squared. So we'll substitute the value in that Cavendish gave us for the universal gravitational constant right here. And incidentally, you'll notice that the units for the gravitational constant are newton meters squared per kilogram squared, which tells us that we have to use kilograms for mass and we have to use meters for the distance between the objects um, if we're going to get force in newtons. So we substitute the values in here and we get a very small gravitational force. Decimal zero, 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 0002 newtons.
So comparing this to a person's weight, that same person on the Earth, if we use our small g equation, we get the person's weight, that is the force of gravity between the person and the Earth, is 600 newtons, which is far greater than the force of gravity between the person and their neighbor. So the force of gravity is extremely weak, especially between everyday objects like people. So here we see, since force of gravity between two objects is equal to big G times mass of the Earth, if you're talking about comparing uh, or using the Earth and some object near the Earth, um, mass of the Earth times the mass of the object, this should give us the force of gravity between those objects. It is equal to the magnitude of G times mass of the Earth times M, so there's the mass of the object. Really, we've just done a bit of factoring here. And that's equal to mg. We already know that the force of gravity between an object on the Earth and the Earth itself is m times small g. So that means that we can find small g this way. Small g is equal to big G, the gravitational constant, times the mass of the Earth over the radius of the Earth squared. The mass of the Earth is, of course, a known constant. And the radius of the Earth, likewise, is a known constant. Now we can do this for any mass. We can also do it on other locations. On the Moon, for example, we can find the gravitational field strength or the acceleration for a free-falling body on the Moon using the same expression, except that instead of the mass of the Earth, we would use the mass of the Moon, and instead of the radius of the Earth, we would use the radius of the Moon. Of course, we would square that radius, just as we would for the Earth. Now we'll try an activity. See if you can calculate various forces of gravity around the solar system. We'll try a few of the planets.